And now it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium this morning Dr. Jane Thrakill, who is a distinguished associate professor of English and comparative literature here on our campus at UNC. And she also directs an initiative called Health and Humanities. So thank you, Dr. Thrakill. Hello, everybody. I am Jane Thrailkill, so I'm here from UNC's College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I am a professor of English, and I do run, along with Jordan Jack, the Health Humanities Lab here at UNC Chapel Hill. I'll be moderating this session on issues for minority populations from early 20th century to the present. When presentations conclude at 1010, we will begin a moderated discussion and take questions from the audience. Because our agenda is so full, my comments about our speakers' biographies will be brief, but more information is available about speakers on the on online program. World War I intersected with the 1918 influenza pandemic in important ways. For example, the fact that soldiers were packed into military units never built for the number of men who they housed and were sent to Europe in boats that were terribly overcrowded. This created breeding grounds for the virus to spread quickly among the population of young men. These young men, unfortunately, proved especially susceptible to this particular strain of influenza. Ever since uh, Dr. Reimer and a group of others created or imagined this influenza pandemic conference, or this conference about going viral, I have been noticing at the edges of television shows, novels, um, and other popular narratives in our culture mention of the flu pandemic. But it's interesting, it's very rare that we have full novelistic representation of the pandemic. It's almost as if the gargantuan scale of it was somehow unimaginable for our expressive artists. So to me as an English professor and a student of history, that to me is, is fascinating. So today to speak about some of these related or questions that fall out from uh, this important pandemic, uh, we have Dr. Adrian Lentz Smith, who will discuss this period in US history, and in the South particularly, in which Jim Crow laws dominated. Dr. Lentz Smith is Associate Professor of History at Duke University, and she wrote about this in her book, Freedom Struggles, African Americans and World War I. Her book examines how African Americans worked through ideas of manhood, citizenship and diaspora to pursue their freedom dreams. Her latest work is focused on black lives and state violence in the twilight of the civil rights years. Second, we will have Dr. Sandra Krause Quinn, who will discuss concerns about trust in vaccines and the healthcare system among minority populations. Dr. Quinn is professor and chair of the Department of Family Science at the University of Maryland's School of Public Health and director of Maryland's Center for Health Equity. She studies vaccination narratives and behaviors using social media, and she studies cultural beliefs related to vaccine uh, and racial disparities, as well as vaccine acceptance in routine and emergency situations, racial disparities in vaccine uptake. Again, more information about these amazing speakers is available on uh, the online program. We'll have time for questions following these two speakers at 10, 10 a.m. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Adrian Lentz Smith. Good morning, everybody. 
Um, if I were cornier, I would point out that we might call Dr. Quinn, Dr. Quinn medicine woman. I'm sure it's not the first time that anyone's done it. And yes, I am that corny. Um, I'm going to take us back to 1918, to the World War I years, for a little bit. I imagine you were there with my historian colleagues a bit yesterday. But I want us to think, you know, I don't know much about health, actually. My own is middling. Um, but I want us to think about the world, the lives that people were living with, the world that the flu sort of impeded on and what that looked like. And I want um, for us to keep in mind a little bit that, what do I want to do? That interventions, um, medicine and intervention only worked in so much as some people were considered worthy or deserving of care. And that others, tr and that people trusted that the caregivers or the people trying to make interventions had their well being in mind, right? So that would limit in the 19 teens how um, folks could address the flu, flu pandemic. And I suspect that were we to have other pandemics in our current moment, it would affect it now. So I'm going to open with a spectacle, a parade. Um, on July 28, 1917, nearly 10,000 African Americans paraded up New York's Fifth Avenue. Children first, then women, then men. All in their Sunday best. Women and children wore all white, as if they were attending a baptism. Men wore dark suits, as if they were on their way to a funeral. They kept disciplined silence, but they carried placards that proclaimed, in so many words, that black lives matter. This protest came in response to the pogrom in East St. Louis. We call it a race riot, but race riots in this period were mobs going into black neighborhoods, raising homes and business and murdering people, um, often by the dozens or the scores. Um, it came in response to a pogrom in East St. Louis earlier that summer, to spectacle lynchings in Memphis and in Waco in the spring and the summer before spectacle lynchings, meaning that they were done publicly, advertised beforehand in front of crowds of hundreds, and that people took body parts as souvenirs away from them in the aftermath. Um, one placard challenged their fellow Americans, newly entered into a global conflict that President Wilson had labeled a war for democracy, to make America safe for democracy as well. Other placards made explicit links between black people's military service and the rights of citizenship so violently denied them. And they form an account, if we sort of read them one after the other, of black military service up through US entry into the First World War. Those placards read, we have fought for the liberty of white Americans in six, in six wars. Our reward is East St. Louis. Another read, the first blood for American independence was shed by a Negro. Crispus Attucks. Another read, Negroes fought for American independence under George Washington. We fought with Perry at Lake Erie. 12,000 of us fought with Jackson at New Orleans. 10,000 of us fought in the Spanish-American War. We helped plant the American flag in every dominion. From Bunker to Carrizal, we have done our bit. Another placard reiterated the tension and conundrum inherent in all these moments of African Americans' military service. Patriotism and loyalty presuppose protection and liberty. Yet, as the NAACP staffers who organized the parade and the 10,000 African Americans who marched well knew, government protection and the privileges of freedom, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, remained elusive goals. I want to jump ahead to the winter of 1918-1919 to read a few snippets from black periodicals and the NAACP records. It's important to keep in mind that the black press in this period was vibrant um, and a necessary alternative to what some might call the fake news being circulated about African Americans in white newspapers. Snippet one. The recent influenza epic has been no respecter of persons, and many people in the prime of their life were stricken down. 
an advertisement in the page, the back of Crisis, the NAACP's monthly magazine, observed in December 1918. According to the ad, the standard-based life insurance, according to the ad, the standard-based life insurance company had issued payment, payments ranging from $500 to $2,500 for flu-related deaths. Another snippet. In Pittsburgh, the men's division of the industrial branch of the local urban league helped to found an emergency hospital in a factory to address the flu pandemic. The hospital employed 14 African-American nurses by 1919. Once the emergency passed, factory owners opted to hire on two African-American nurses on a permanent basis. Stepping back to November 1918, let me cite a bulletin in which numerous NAAC branches announced their activities hampered, as the DC folks wrote, by the outbreak of the Spanish flu. In Charleston, West Virginia, for example, the branch set aside their Liberty Loan Drive to focus on caring for the sick. Members in Beaumont, Texas wrote that they had been, quote, deprived of holding any meeting for three weeks on account of the Spanish influenza. The Montgomery branch, too, blamed the flu and the accompanying quarantine for keeping their numbers down. Investing a investigating a series of lynchings that same November, the deputy head of the NAACP, Walter White, found a witness laid up in bed, sick with the Spanish influenza. Both White and the man's doctors tried to convince the witness to go on record with what he knew about these lynchings, a spate of them, horrific, um, including a lynching of a, of a black woman who was pregnant and the subsequent um, attack on her baby, um, to, to testify on what he knew. White promised to re relocate him and his five children up north for their protection, to find him a job, and to support him until after he testified. The man turned the NAACP down, citing his children's vulnerability, the fact that his aunt's cousins and other extended kin would be left behind and subject to retribution if he fled, and that he owned three pieces of property in the surrounding counties. He would sell them, if he could sell them, at a great loss. Um, exile, then, would mean losing his livelihood and putting his family in the crosshairs of local white folks who had leached, lynched at least 10 people since that May. Lying abed, tended by two doctors, that man understood better than Walter White that he literally could not afford to be brave. So what do these snippets tell us? On the broadest scale, they tell us that the flu interrupted lives being lived in all of their mundanity, ambition, tragedy, and horror. As the life insurance ad reminded readers, the flu was no respecter of persons. But these snippets, snippets give us glimpses, too, of the lives folks were leading as the war, then illness, raged around them. In the report from the Urban League, we hear a suggestion of the great migration of African Americans to urban centers, particularly in the industrial north. Dating from 1910 or so, the migration of African Americans out of the Black Belt accelerated with wartime mobilization, so that between 1916, and we can kind of look through to 1930 through the 20s, about one million African Americans left the South at a rate of about 500 per day. These numbers would accelerate even more. You know, the Second World War um, had even a more a sort of higher amount of migration. The report from various NAACP branches shows an organization with momentum temporarily stymied though that momentum was. Founded in 1909, after a riot in Springfield, Illinois, the NAACP had grown steadily, but it truly bloomed during the World War I years, from 9,000 members in 1917 to 90,000 in 1919. With 300 local branches, the organization was very much what its members, often working class, quite often activist women, made of it. And then there's the Lowndes and Brooks County lynchings in Georgia. They were particularly horrific, but they were not isolated. By the most conservative estimates, 208 African Americans were lynched in Woodrow Wilson's first term from 1913 to 1917, and another 172 in the World War I years from 1917 to 1919. In some, folks just disappeared. Others were public spectacles. The Georgia lynchings had both. 
Such violence remind us, reminds us that Jim Crow, what Southerners proudly referred to as white supremacy, um, was a system of political economy structured and defended through white racial terror. More than a slogan and less than a fact, historian Steve Kantrowitz has observed, white supremacy was a social argument and a political program. It consisted of ideas and practices, promises and threats, oratory and murder. In other words, it was a campaign waged by white elites to limit African Americans' political, economic, and social power. And important, too, it was a wage to keep everyday white folks in line. That is, to convince them that their racial interests, their identity as white people, trumped any other way that they might imagine their interests, their communities, and even themselves, class for example, economic interests or a sort of broadly conceived religious community. It's important to remember that white supremacy was not static. It kept forming and reforming in response to political and social circumstances, especially in response to challenges waged by African Americans in the South and their allies. So World War I was one of these moments of disruption and remaking. Pro-war progressive in the history sense progressive, you know, the sort of busy social reform, you know, sort of the public health forebears, right? Um, Pro-war pro progressive John Dewey thought of World War I as a plastic juncture in which the world might be made anew. Most African Americans were a bit less florid in their optimism than Dewey, but they too hoped that the war might at least clip Jim Crow's wings. So in my remaining um, few minutes, I want to sketch for you what this moment looked like. The war would bring uh, African Americans a host of new experiences. About 386,000 African Americans served in the mil wartime military, um, and millions more registered for the draft. 200,000 of them traveled overseas with the American Expeditionary Forces, 40,000 of them as combat troops, most of them as labor troops, um, largely because the army did not believe in um, either the capacity for African Americans to fight or the wisdom of arming black men and telling them that fighting for democracy was a noble cause. Some people believed both at the same time. Um, but mobilization became an occasion for all sorts of African Americans to think about their relationship to the nation, to the world, to their fellow Americans, to other communities of color. Um, it also gave them a rallying cry, this idea of a war for democracy, for asking for or demanding freedom at home. It did not offer a distinct break from the dynamics of white supremacy. Rather, it, service abroad um, and service in domestic camps offered an extension of Jim Crow mores into their military space. African Americans fighting abroad found themselves um, wrangling with their fellow Americans, white Americans, more steadily and more often than they fought any foreign, foreign enemy. Soldiers wrote home about fellow soldiers arrested or shot for talking to French women. They wrote of riots overseas, race riots overseas. They wrote of lynchings in French towns. Um, they sent back accounts of black officers. There were only a handful. There were fewer by the end of the war than they had, there had been at the beginning because they were often demoted for no reason other than that white officials didn't believe them capable of being officers. Um, but they wrote also of the way in which France, France as a space offered them a place to be and experience being something other than debased, right? So not that France was without racism, it had its own empire and sort of colonial subjects to, to manage, but what France did or what the French did was to treat African Americans as Americans first. Um, and black second. Basically, African Americans were not French people's problem, so they didn't try to manage them, right? Which gave black soldiers and folks moving around a, a space and a place to explore other ways of being. Intellectual and activist W.E.B. Du Bois captured some of the rage and resolve of African American veterans in his rousing editorial, Returning Soldiers, that ran in the crisis in May of 1919. 
The editorial is angry, angry but purposely or pur purposefully so. In it, Du Bois decries the vindictive fate that had African Americans fighting for a dominant minority that had wanted to debase black folks as, he writes, servants, whores, dogs, and monkeys. He supplies a searing litany of ill doing. It lynches, it defranches, it, dis it disfranchises, it steals from us, it insults us. But in the end, Du Bois shifts to a call to, a call to arms. By the end of he writes, by the God of heaven, we are cowards and jackasses. If now that the war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain and brawn to fight a sterner, longer, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France, and by the great Jehovah, we shall save it in the United States or know the reason why. Du Bois's editorial had fury, but it also had great pride, and it had hope. When I first started writing my book, Freedom Struggles, I focused on that hope. But one reads books differently in different moments. And from my current vantage point, as I wonder about the care we take, or don't, with our current crop of returning veterans, many of whom hail from marginalized and even reviled communities, and as I watch with bemusement as people reject the current assertion that black lives matter, in part because they seem to miss that that assertion is a rejoinder to the claim made in both word and deed that those lives don't matter, I better understand the hurt and the ferocity that underlies the returning soldier's editorial. Now, as I read accounts of someone like former Lieutenant Rayford Logan's writing in his memoirs about his Jim Crow shell shock, where he writes that he fought two wars at once, Woodrow Wilson's and his own, and he doesn't know which one did more damage to him. Or black soldier, black stevedore, Ely Green's account of watching military policemen nearly kill black soldiers in the stockade, mostly because they were bored and had nothing better to do or Green's other memories of being run out of Texas after the war by the Klan because he refused to stop wearing either his military uniform or his chauffeur's uniform. I grasp the rage that underlie Du Bois's editorial, rage which seared black soldiers, either tempering them or consuming them, mobilizing them or eating them alive. But rage can't flame indefinitely. It burns through turning to despair, indifference, or resolve. Black veterans knew this, as did the segregationists who, Im who opposed them. Um, each told stories, segregationist, segregationist white veterans who wrote to their senators, warning them to guard against black militancy, African-American soldiers who wrote to the government and said, y'all better watch out for we is coming. It is one, it's in the military intelligence files because when you write things like that, you end up getting surveilled. Um, but all of these things you see feeding a post-war energy, right, on both sides, growing African-American militancy, the viciousness of the Red Summer, which was a reaction in large part to the achievement of the World War I years. Um, and all of them, I think, have something to say to us now. I'm struck um, by the number of soldiers who show up both appealing to the federal government in the run-up to World War II and warning them that this time around they're not going to serve loyally first and hope for reward later, that they are saying we will bargain with you now get concrete rights, and then we will show up to fight. Um, people like Charles Hamilton Houston, who was a judge advocate general during World War I, came out saying he would never be that powerless to t defend people again, went to Harvard Law School, and becomes the lawyer who trains a coterie of lawyers at Howard, Howard Law School, including Thurgood Marshall. He's the midwife of the sort of strategy to to bring down segregation through, through litigation. Um, and Houston is interesting to me because he, like Rayford Logan and others, are people who felt as veterans that they were entitled both to their rage and to their rights. And because he pursued civil rights 
through the state, right? Understanding state power. And, but through a state whose good faith he, and he did not trust and whose good will he never actually hoped for. It's an unrelenting pragmatism that is fascinating to me, even inspiring, and one that I think provides a way through thinking about how to advocate for and pursue positive interventions and change, even when so many things from the federal government as directed towards communities of color feel like betrayal. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have Dr. Quinn with her talk. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Dean Reimer. This is very exciting to be here. Dr. Lynn Smith was uh, an, um, provided a foundation for what I'm about to say in, in talking about more contemporary times. I'm going, whoops. There we go. I'm going to talk about building trust in the flu vaccine, some of the challenges and opportunities with African Americans. Much of my work is focused on African Americans. However, some of the issues that arise also arise with other populations, and I'll speak to that briefly. So, Dr. Lynn Smith will, she really described you know, life in a Jim Crow South with extreme segregation. So let me quickly read this. Camp Wheeler, Macon, Georgia, October 26, 1918. Thinking soldier guards pacing the station platform wearing flu masks were a reception committee of the Ku Klux Klan. 1,300 Negro selected men were given the fright of their lives when they arrived here. Ku Kluxes yelled the first Negro as he landed on the station platform and stared into the gauze mass face of a century. 1,500 Negroes then made a scramble for cover. It took the military authorities some time to convince the Negroes that the mass were intended to protect their lives. We can understand why a sense that those soldiers waiting were there to protect their lives was probably not within the realm of the experiences of the men getting off that train. Context matters, and context matters today as well as it did in 1918. So I have to acknowledge my research team at the University of Maryland, University of Georgia, and University of Pittsburgh. And what I'm going to do today is not talk about odds ratios and show you graphs and figures, but to talk about some of the, the themes we've learned in our journey in trying to understand uh, why there are consistent year-after-year -year disparities in African Americans receiving the flu vaccine, even when the rate of disparities in chronic diseases that place many at, at increased risk of complications makes this a serious matter. So I'm going to speak from the data of three data sets one conducted at the beginning of the H1N1 pandemic, one conducted sort of partway through it, as it turns out, closer to the end in 2010, and then one conducted in 2015. The first two, 2009, 2010, were whites, African Americans, and English and Spanish-speaking Latinos. The second, the third one, excuse me, the third one in 2015 was only whites and African Americans because we really wanted to focus on those issues evenly split, a little over 100 of each. We did also extensive qualitative research with 110 whites and African Americans in Maryland and in Georgia that included exploratory interviews, nine focus groups, and then extended in-depth interviews. So I'm gonna talk about sort of what we did and what we heard. So 2009, and Carrie uh, Lubell told us yesterday, high levels of uncertainty, high media interest, 
There was certainly a flu, seasonal flu vaccine production was underway by the time we knew we had a pandemic. It was uncertain when or if we would have an H1N1 vaccine. And in the press, there was a discussion of having um, an emergency use authorization, which means the FDA in a public health emergency can approve the use of a vaccine or a drug that's really still in the, um, in the experimental stages. So these are all, this was the context in which we decided to investigate trust and other attitudes. We measured in both surveys trust in information sources local and state and federal public health agencies, local, state, and federal elected officials, President Obama, and the Secretaries of Health and, and, and Human Services and Homeland Security, who were both visible at the time of the pandemic. We looked at trust in other sources, news, different types of news organizations, healthcare providers, families, friends, and then trust in government action during the pandemic. Not trust in government writ large, but specific to how the government would react in the pandemic. How open were, was the government, how honest, how caring, how committed, to what extent did people believe that the government would act in their best interest. At the second survey in 2010, we also sought to understand how they felt about the communication. And so we were interested in how clear they saw the information being, how consistent, to what extent they were okay as, as, as information changed, as government learned more, and how open did they feel the government had been. Finally, President Obama talked openly about getting his daughters vaccinated, and so we were interested. Did this change confidence and trust in the vaccine? So what did we find? Typically, when you do social surveys, you find African Americans, Latinos, often have lower trust in government, in part because of all the things we just heard. What we found in June of 2009, several months after the inauguration of President Obama, that actually whites had the lowest levels of trust in government actions, and African Americans and Latinos had higher trust. Context matters. Public health officials, this will be good news for many of you who are practitioners in the room, for Dr. Devlin, who's devoted her life to this, that public health officials were more trusted than elected officials. So bad news for the elected officials. Personal health care providers were highly trusted by both, um, for, by all three groups in these surveys, but, but African Americans still trusted them less than whites. And finally, people who reported they closely followed the news, they were paying attention and had high level of knowledge, knowledge actually had higher levels of trust. So again, kept, you know, see that theme around communication, understanding, and information. But we also heard that trust alone did not predict vaccine uptake for African Americans and Latinos. When we did, and that was in the, the first survey, when we did the second survey, we did find some promising things. That the quality of communication made a difference, that the extent to which people were following the news, the extent to which they saw the quality of communication as being high, and the, the President Obama's willingness to talk about his daughters actually made a difference in trust in government action and trust in government spokespersons. And that's important. So we'll come back to all these in a moment. The other thing is that quality of communication Made a, diff made a difference. We asked people who hadn't yet gotten vaccinated, did they intend? And that quality of communication was a variable that made a difference, moving them from no to either I don't know or yes. But given what we heard here, we knew we didn't fully understand this. Trust is actually often the sort of the bucket. When we can't explain all the variants, we say, oh, it must be trust. Well, what we recognized is a couple of things. Number one, that we needed to understand trust in the vaccine, not just trust in government actions. And we also 
Um, we learned in, in listening to people doing our qualitative research that whites, no matter what their age, and African Americans had sort of two foundational kinds of perspectives. For whites, they said, you know, the polio vaccine was such a success. You know, it just made me trust. I don't question vaccines. African Americans, the first focus group, not surprising, I was not shocked at this. First person says, how can you even talk about vaccines without talking about the Tuskegee syphilis study? So, you know, we heard those things sort of from both. African Americans were more likely to talk about conspiracies around the flu vaccine. Um, everyone united in, in talking about pharmaceutical companies having a profit motive. When whites question the competence, uh, or when whites question government around vaccines, they question competence. When African Americans question, they question motives. Would government act in our best interest? And finally, they also had different perspectives on perceived risk of the vaccine itself. So whites tend to think of if their side effects are going to be mild, my arm might be sore. African Americans saw them as far more serious. You could die. It's a live virus. It can kill you. So we used all that to create a number of valid, reliable measures. We measured generalized trust. We asked about trust in the flu vaccine. And we had heard that nobody understood this process we go through every year of creating a flu vaccine. So we, really, we created an infographic and literally showed it to them and then asked about trust in all the parties present there. And what we found, uh, let me back up before I go to findings. The other thing is we were influenced by public health critical race praxis and really hearing white privilege and the perspective of African Americans in the qualitative research. So again, we created a set of, of, of variables. Racial fairness is trust, um, is treatment in healthcare or by the government fair to one's race? How conscious are you of, of your race in a healthcare setting? Have you experienced discrimination? And what impact does that have on your ability to get health care? And we asked this of both. We asked from the perspective of one's race, because we thought we were hearing white privilege, and we were certainly hearing what it feels like to live as an African American in the United States. African Americans had lower trust in all organizations, but the same rank order as whites. So doctors, one's a personal doctor, CDC, so good news for the CDC folks. FDA were trusted. Pharmaceutical companies were, were where everyone agreed. They did not trust the drug companies. But we also found, and this is the good news, that, that when you measure trust in the vaccine itself and in the production process, that it actually did predict increased vaccine uptake. So, that's, we'll come back to all this a little bit later. But there are a couple of other things that are tied to this. That higher perceived disease risk, lower perceived risk of side effects, higher knowledge of the flu, older age, and higher income are associated with trust. So those are important things to think about. Higher racial consciousness, so the, the more you're conscious of your race in a healthcare setting, and experience with discrimination, not surprisingly, was associated with higher perceived risk from vaccine side effects, lower trust, and lower uptake. And so this was really powerful for African Americans, not significant for whites. For both groups, interestingly, higher perceived racial fairness was associated with higher trust in the process, the vaccine, and greater uptake. That was for both groups. So what do we do about this? How do we address and increase trust and uptake of the vaccine? So in the focus groups, while we certainly heard a lot about Tuskegee, we also had a number of people who said things like this, and this is two different African-American participants. 
The mistrust needs to be done away with. Some of that stuff is just old and outdated. So the same thing with this vaccine indoctrination mindset. Some of that stuff is just old. The government has become more trustworthy in some areas. And so I was willing to give the flu vaccine a shot. By the way, this is 2013, maybe early 2014. I trust them, and I'm going to tell you why. There are too many people that work in government that have our best interest. So please, don't think the government is trying to hurt us if they say, go get your flu shot. I don't believe they are. So that's what I mean. I think we have some opportunities and some ways forward, not without challenges. But what do we do? So public health agencies, be they local, federal, um, I think do a, a good job at talking about get the vaccine. They do a good job at talking about um, risk of the disease by and large. However, there's still a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding of the vaccine, of flu itself. And certainly we saw that as associated with trust. So I think some of the communication needs to begin to address that issue. The perceived risk of side effects. We don't often talk about those things. And I think the, cl the clear message about quality of communication is we need to be open and talk directly about these. If we don't, social media will and others will. So that's an important communication um, message. Finally, we did hear a lot about barriers and, and, and higher perceived barriers were associated with lower trust. And so those barriers were perceived as costs for sure, but they were also things like, well, is that vaccine that I get in my black neighborhood the same as the vaccine that you get in your rich white neighborhood? How, why do we have shortages, but you don't have shortages? So attention to those perceived barriers, and I say perceived, because the perception is as important as if it were the reality. But a couple of other things we learned, that when we looked at vaccine behavior across five years as we did, you know, clearly what we saw is that we need more attention to younger African Americans, lower income African Americans. We did a paper that literally just looked at our African American participants by their vaccine behavior. And so I think we have opportunities because we have a universal flu vaccine recommendation we have opportunities to reach out to younger people, to lower income people. But the quality of communication is essential here. And in a pandemic, we often say, you know, the key principles, communicate early, communicate often, be open, address uncertainty, warn your population, your public, that there will be uncertainty, information will change. Dr. Frieden actually did that very well. Demonstrate empathy. Say that you understand this will be hard. And CDC has learned that lesson actually pretty well since anthrax. The caution in today's media um, period is to not to get engaged in myths and misinformation. That's a longer conversation. We also found that language matters. And so when, when EUA fact sheets talk about things like experimental drugs, clinical trials, that is immediately a trigger, particularly for African Americans, and, and that decreases likelihood. So language matters. We cannot do this unless healthcare systems change. This is not just on the backs of the population and African American communities but addressing what we know is still problematic. Um, racial bias in healthcare is critical, and I, I'm heartened by some of the efforts to do implicit association tests and other efforts to increase the ability of providers to address and be in trustworthy, build trusting relationships. But we also know that, that providers in general and African American providers do not take the flu vaccine. That's a critical issue. If I'm asking you, do you take it, and you say to me, I don't take it, that is going to be a, a clue to me. So having increasing that vaccine uptake is critical. But the other things we know from the literature that African Americans 
when they go during the flu season to see a provider are less likely to get a recommendation and an offer at the same visit. Yet we know if you get a recommendation and an offer, Dr. Lynn Smith, I strongly recommend you get this vaccine. By the way, I got mine last week and I can have my nurse give it to you today. You know what? Vaccine uptake goes up. But finally, I think within communities and public health agencies work well, or many of them work well, with community organizations. And I think it's essential that we address these concerns in this ongoing dialogue. You know, that we begin to change what we heard in our uh, qualitative data. People don't talk a lot about getting the flu vaccine, but if they believe people close to them, their family and friends and their doctor want them to get it, their vac their trust in the vaccine and their vaccine uptake goes up. So changing that social norm is critical. So context matters. And today in an era when, when people believe that the Black Lives Movement is critical just to get respect and to feel safe in communities, then I think today it's going to take not just African American communities, healthcare providers, healthcare systems, and public health agencies all working together to, to change this. And here's the bottom line, or what we call the gist. We know from our work that if you take a seasonal flu vaccine every year, when there's a pandemic, as, as there was in 2009, you're more likely to get the, the vaccine. So this is work that has to be done today, not when another pandemic arrives. So I must acknowledge NIH, National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, CDC, and the Food and Drug Administration for their support. Thank you.